Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, Mike Biamonti, School of Operational Medicine, FBI. I'm gonna jump into video number 10. Can't believe there's 10 of these things already. Uh, this is gonna be airway part two. Uh, I think everybody enjoyed airway part one. We focused a bit more on the science, a bit more on the uh, anatomy and physiology. Now we're gonna roll more into assessment of the patient having difficulty breathing, how to treat them, different adjuncts that are out there, different techniques. We're not going to get too crazy uh, because if you're watching this, chances are you're already a certified medical provider. So I'm not going to sit here and tell you how to put an NPA in or we're going to discuss NPA, OPA. We're going to move through those pretty quickly, but then we'll get more into applying some of these techniques uh, based on your patient assessment. Uh, let's see. I uh, just want to make sure I'm going to cover everything. Uh, I've changed the background again. For whatever reason, that's a big thing. I guess it's just uh, people are tired of looking at me and they're looking behind me. So uh, I got away from some of the pictures that were hanging up behind me. And, uh, so I just moved to another piece of my desk, essentially, and I've got my coin collection behind me. Uh, something I made a few years ago uh, for all the, all the coins that I've collected over the years. Pretty neat. And uh, also, what can I have? A little Jack Daniels barrel it's in my office. I don't have a problem or anything. Funny story actually behind that. Uh, when I was teaching at the community college, we had these big graduations. And one of the classes I taught was a big class. It was, I think it started off with 110 students, but it whittled down to about 60. But at the end, we had 60 students graduating. So they all came and you know, they walked stage and handshake and certificate and that kind of thing. Well, unbeknownst to me, they had all planned this that as they came up and received their certificate of completion from me, they handed me a little airline bottle of Jack Daniels. So the first couple were funny. Everybody was laughing. But now imagine I got 500 family members sitting in an audience and students are coming up and each one of them are handing me these little bottles of Jack. Well, now the whole podium is packed with these bottles of Jack Daniels. And <clears throat> not that I have a problem or anything, but I thought that was kind of funny. So they also got me that bottle. I'm sorry, that barrel, which unfortunately was empty when they gave it to me. But still, it was just a great, great gift. So it sits uh, in my office at home now, which I think is kind of funny. Anyway, let's get back to airway. Oh, and Chicago. Shout out to Chicago. I'm running out of polos to, 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 to talk about. Um, so now I'm going to start transitioning into different shirts to give everybody kudos. Uh, Chicago Fire Department. They are a classy operation. They have helped us up and helped us out in the bureau a number of times. Fantastic organization. So I love the Windy City. I always have a good time when I go there. All right, airway. Let's talk about airway and how to manage someone's airway and uh, what can create problems with a patient's airway. Uh, there's a number of different reasons somebody can have trouble breathing. Uh, some are medical and some are trauma. Can't stand it anymore. I've got to get out of here. I've got to get out of here. Calm down. Get a hold of yourself. Stewardess, please let me handle this. Calm down. Now get back to your seat. I'll take care of this. Calm down. Calm down. Get a hold of yourself. Doctor, you want another phone? Everything's going to be all right. Please. Sister, please. 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 Love that movie. Uh, so when we look at somebody's airway, in the basic of basic assessments, airway breathing circulation, it's yes or no questions. Is their airway open? Yes or no. Are they breathing? Yes or no. How are they breathing? How can we assist them? It really comes down to your gut. When you're looking at somebody, a patient, and they look like they need help breathing. What I mean by help breathing, they're unconscious, unresponsive, snoring on their tongue, bradypnea, slow breathing. Yeah, that's somebody who needs uh, assistance. Uh, if they're looking at you and talking to you, they don't need my help. Maybe they need some supplemental oxygen, and we'll get more into that. But a lot of it is based on how they look to you. So, are they sick or not sick? If they're not sick and they're talking to you, but they're just a little out of breath, well, there's no real significant intervention for us. Maybe some oxygen. And a lot of giving a patient oxygen is, is the psychological factor of it. I'm not going to say placebo. That's not the right way to think about it. But if you do nothing for a patient who's having trouble breathing, 
Well, they're certainly not going to get any better. If you give them nothing more than a nasal cannula with one to six liters per minute of oxygen or a non-rebreather or whatever, the patient hears the hissing of that oxygen. They can feel the oxygen blowing up into their nose or on their face. So from a, a mental perspective, psychologically, they feel like, well, I'm getting oxygen. I must be getting better. So that, that has a, a real profound effect in some of your patients and how they respond. Think about, for anybody who's been doing this for a while, think about your COPD or your emphysemic patient who's been smoking for 100 years. They're in a, in a room in the back of the house and you have to follow 100 miles of O2 tubing to find your patient like a trail of breadcrumbs to the back room. They're smoking their cigarette and they got the, the ashtray piled up with the cigarette butts. I got trouble breathing. <laughs> yeah, me too. I've been standing in this room for 30 seconds. I feel like I'm going to die, right? It's just smoke is banked down to about here. It's a disaster. But they've got this nasal cannula in their nose being pushed to them from a, an O2 generator that's 100 feet away and it's going to two liters a minute. They're getting nothing. But if you take that nasal cannula off of them, they're going to lose their mind. I need my oxygen. I need my oxygen. It, it, it's, it's, it's a psychological thing. So if you have oxygen, if you have that kind of uh, support and those kind of tools in your, in, your, in your arsenal, yeah, go ahead and give it to them. It'll make them feel better. Whether it's doing anything or not, who knows? A lot of what we do is psychological. Right? Do we make them feel better? Do they feel like we're doing something for them? Uh, so trouble breathing a lot of times, not always, trust me, not always. Uh, some of the times difficulty breathing is, is here, but it can be cardiac issues, respiratory issues, metabolic issues, traumatic issues, uh, any number of different things can cause trouble breathing. So does it hurt to give somebody oxygen? No, it doesn't. Uh, as I alluded to in one of the other videos, uh, there were teachings years ago when I went through school uh, that if you sh even showed a COPD or uh, a nasal cannula uh, or a non-rebreather, they were going to drop dead. They were going to stop breathing. That's not the case. Uh, that's old mantra. That's an old way of thinking about things. For us, if somebody has trouble breathing and we have oxygen and we have the cannula, the mask, or give it to them. Uh, it's not going to hurt them. It really isn't. We had a lot of choices years ago. We had nasal cannulas, non-rebreathers, partial non-rebreathers, venturi masks. Uh, we had all kinds of different options for, keep it simple. If they're not sick and they just need a little bit of oxygen, give them a nasal cannula. If they're sick and they need it, give them a non-rebreather and figure it out from there. So when we talk about somebody who's sick, not sick, and I've said that a few times now, and even in the, the patient assessment video, we didn't dive too deep into it, but how do you know somebody is sick. How do you know somebody is having trouble breathing? Well, look at them. I mean, that's the easiest way to tell. You don't need a, you know, MD at the end of your name. You don't need an alphabet soup at the end of your name. Uh, you just need to be able to look at somebody and say, they look like shit, right? They look like they're having trouble breathing. That's as scientific as it gets. So, you know, you talk about dyspnea. Dyspnea is the technical word for difficulty breathing. Okay, they're dysmic. Um, are they orthopnic? Orthopnea is a condition of increased difficulty breathing while lying flat. So if you have a CHF or somebody who has congestive heart failure, uh, sometimes your, your, your larger patients, um, if they lay flat, they can't breathe. So they have to sleep sitting up. So you as a medical detective, you walk into someone's room, bedroom specifically, or even living room, and you see one half of the bed with all these pillows propped up against the headboard, and they look well lived in. Ask the patient, hey, is that where you sleep? Oh, yeah. Do you always sleep sitting up? Oh, yeah, I've always had to sleep. What happens if you sleep laying down? Oh, I can't breathe. Okay, that's a pertinent positive finding. Right? That patient has something going on either chronically or acutely that causes them difficulty breathing. Typically, that's a cardiac world when you're dealing with orthopnea. Um, there's dyspnea on exertion, or DOE, not Department of Energy, uh, dyspnea on exertion. These are people who are fine if they're sitting quietly, right? watching TV, doing their thing. Now they get up and they, they're having a hard time breathing. This is, again, typically your cardiac patients, typically, or they could just be horribly out of shape, uh, morbidly obese, uh, concomitant medical illnesses that make them short of breath. There's a couple of different things. 
but that's also a pertinent positive finding. Okay, they suffer from dyspnea on exertion. They suffer from three to four pillow orthopnea, uh, all positive findings. There's also um, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, PND. Paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, wow. These are people who have trouble sleeping at night or they get woken up in the middle of the night and they feel like they can't breathe. Uh, again, these are typically your cardiac patients. You find some patients are tripoding. As soon as you walk in the door, right, you walk in the door and they are, they are hunched over like this on their knees and, and they give me that look, right, that big eyed, holy cow, I think I'm going to die look. And they are using all their accessory muscles and they're leaning forward. That's tripod position. What they're doing and when they're shoulders shrugging like this and using accessory muscles, your intercostals, your sternocleidomastoids, your, your pectoris minors, your pectoris majors, um, when we breathe, uh, our chest doesn't circumferentially expand like this. It doesn't work that way. What ends up happening is we breathe from a, a lateral perspective, the front of our chest wall gets pulled up. So our pectoris, or minor, major, and if I'm wrong on that, please forgive me, they connect to our clavicles, and they connect to the anterior aspect of our rib cage. So when we're in respiratory distress and we, we shrug our shoulders, we're helping the body pull the anterior chest up to increase that intrathoracic space, to lower intrathoracic pressure, to help us breathe in. So when we shrug our shoulders to breathe heavy, we're helping the chest expand and create that negative pressure to help pull air in. Those are accessory muscle uses. This is how we use these accessory muscles to breathe. Um, so when we talk about tripoding, that's the body helping itself try to get more air in. It's definitely a pertinent positive finding. There's also a condition known as pulseless paradoxus. Uh, it's a very complicated um, I shouldn't say it's a complicated theory. It's difficult for us to find in the field. You'd have to have internal monitors for blood pressure. And it's for patients who have uh, COPD, asthma, um, any kind of heavy intrathoracic pressure. When they take a deep breath in, their systolic blood pressure actually drops by about 10 millimeters of mercury or more. Now, how are we going to find that in the field? We're not. If you happen to have a patient who is that bad, I mean, a bad asthmatic, bad COPD, -er, and you're feeling their radial pulse, and as they take a deep breath in, it weakens or almost disappears, but then when they exhale, it comes back. That's a very loose, soft way of, of figuring out pulses paradoxus. But you'll have other things to look at in your patient presentation to realize they're, they're sick versus pulseless paradoxes, but that's just a, a little, uh, little term to throw out there. So let's look at different respiratory patterns. This has always confused me, uh, even as a, a years-long provider, and I've struggled with it. You know, is this uh, chain stokes? Is this biots? Is this apneustic? Is this, uh, you know, uh, what kind of respiratory pattern is... Who cares? <laughs> There's the answer. Who cares? As far as I'm concerned, if somebody's having trouble breathing, okay, they're suffering from dyspnea, uh, you know, it's an irregular respiratory or ventilatory pattern, okay, it's fast or it's slow, that's all you have to describe. For us to get into the minutia, for us to get into the details of, oh, this is biots, no, this is ataxic, no, I think this is... Let me show you this slide. What we're seeing on this slide is the example of chain stokes versus apneustic versus ataxic versus biots versus, I mean, I mean ataxic versus kusmal, okay, uh, biots versus chain stokes, all right, uh, who cares, <laughs> all right? So if you're describing a, a ventilatory pattern, it's fast, it's slow. It's regular, it's irregular. All right, yeah, they're breathing away, but then they have periods of apnea where they're not breathing at all. That's how you describe it. Let the professionals figure it out. And this reminds me almost of a, of a 12 lead uh, description. If you put a 12 lead EKG in front of 12 cardiologists, you're gonna get 12 different interpretations of that EKG. 
You put 12 different physicians in a room watching someone breathe, you'll probably get about eight to 10 different, oh, no, 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 that's biots. Oh, no, 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 that, at the end of the day, who cares? If they need ventilatory assistance, treat them. If they don't need it, don't treat them. But watch them because they may need that ventilatory assistance in the very near future based on what you're seeing in front of you. Remember, we're always, we should always be living 10 minutes ahead of where we are. So look at your patient and look at the way they're breathing. All right, they may need some help here soon because they're quote unquote getting tired. Uh, you'll start to see that a lot in your asthmatics and your COPDers. And we'll get into asthma and COPD and, and different uh, respiratory conditions in a later video and really get into the weeds on those. But there are patients who are just getting tired. And, and you'll, you'll hear that in a lot of descriptions as far as presentation goes. So let me go ahead and pull the slide down. So when we talk about a patient getting tired, uh, think about the muscles of, of ventilation. So right now, as I sit here and flap my gums at you uh, incessantly for 45 minutes, I'm not in respiratory distress. Yes, you know I'm breathing because I'm, I'm sitting here yammering away. Do you hear me breathing? Do you see me breathing? You know, do you, you ever see those people? Oh, they make me crazy. I mean, I travel a lot, so I'm in airports a lot. And you get those those heavy breathers when they're eating. Oh my God, that makes me crazy. You, they're sitting two stools away from you, or, you know, because typically I sit at a bar, go figure. And as they're eating, like, oh my God, you're disgusting. No wonder why you travel. Nobody wants to live with you. It's horrible. These are people who you can hear them breathing. You can see them breathing. I'm not saying they need to be treated. Uh, they probably have a lot of other problems. But if you come into a patient's room and, or, and it's into their space and you physically see them breathing, you physically hear them breathing, well, that's a problem. That's somebody who's in distress. Uh, breathing should be effortless. Breathing should be quiet. You shouldn't see somebody breathing. So when we talk about respiratory patterns, it's all about how does your patient present and do I have to treat them? So if they're already showing you signs and symptoms of having trouble breathing, you better anticipate that they're going to start getting tired because these muscles that keep us breathing, these accessory muscles, they will fatigue and over time they will fail. So think about going to the gym and grabbing a few dumbbells and start to do curls, 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 curls. Eventually, it's going to get to the point where... And your arms are just going to fail, right? The biceps of your arm are just going to say, nope, that's it, I'm done, I can't do any more. You've gone to muscle failure, which in some theories in working out, that's the way to do it. I don't know, I'm not a, an exercise therapist or physiologist. But in the respiratory world, in the breathing world, that's pretty realistic. So people will breathe breathe, breathe, and all these accessory muscles that are helping them breathe while they're in extremis will fail and they will stop breathing. Um, you'll hear that in a report. I've said it countless times to nurses and doctors when I come in, hey, we got this such and such patient, they're complaining of such and such, they're starting to get tired. In other words, hey, keep your head on a swivel, you're going to be innovating this patient soon, or they're going to need CPAP, or they're going to need all other interventions we're going to talk about. So you've got to sort of anticipate where they're going. Kids will just drop off. So in the adult world, you're going to have difficulty breathing, difficulty breathing, difficulty breathing. You're going to sort of plateau. You're going to get tired, 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 and then you're going to stop breathing. It's a bell curve. Uh, kids aren't that way. Their little muscles are going to fatigue very quickly, and they're going to compensate well. Compensate, 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 plateau, stop. So kids, you really got to watch closely, and we'll do a a video on pediatrics here later on as well. All right, stay on track here. Make sure we're looking good. Ugh. I have this as a note. We're going to talk about suctioning, um, but also uh, stoma patients. We, uh, within the FBI, we're very fortunate in the people that we treat internally, our own team members, most of us are fairly healthy. Uh, we don't have huge medical problems. Uh, so we don't have to worry about a lot of the things that civilian EMS and fire have to worry about. So stoma, as an example, the surgical opening right here. Perhaps somebody has had uh, laryngeal cancer or something to that effect, and, and they've got this opening now to breathe through. 
they can get pretty disgusting. Uh, most people take care of them just fine. Uh, they're very hygienic. They clean them on a regular basis. They're open. There's no problems. Some people, not so much. Uh, they don't take care of them very well. They have this little this little piece of cheesecloth that goes over and gets all gunked up with mucus and nastiness. And they'll call 911 because they can't breathe. Why can't they breathe? Because they've got this gelatinous slug. Oh, it's disgusting. That they pull out of this hole. And it's a, it's a, a mucus plug. It's disgusting. Um, so if we have somebody who's in respiratory distress and they've got a stoma, a couple of quick questions you have to ask is, are they exclusively breathing, breathing through this hole here? Or are they half breathing out of their nose and mouth, half breathing out of this? Uh, so if you have somebody who's completely gorked, say cardiac arrest as an example, and they've got a stoma, well, if you bag on their nose and mouth with a BVM, nothing's going to happen. It's not going to get to the lungs. You have to bag through this hole. And you can do that very effectively with either a pediatric mask, put it on the end of a BVM, pop it right over, and bag on it. Works great. Or if you're an advanced provider, it's the easiest intubation in the world. Take the ET tube, stick it in the hole, and you've intubated. Life is good. But you have to be careful if you're bagging on this with a mask. Half the air may be coming out of the nose and mouth. Uh, so these are just things to think about when you're bagging somebody with a soma. Um, so with suctioning, uh, in the tactical arena, in the, uh, in the FBI world, SWAT teams, whatever, you're not hauling around suction units with you, although it would be nice. You're, just, you're traveling light. So we use a 60cc syringe with a Tumi adapter on the end and an NPA, a nasal pharyngeal airway. And we take the Tumi syringe, we stick it into the, into the NPA, stick that in their mouth, and we suction them. Works. It's primitive. There's no batteries. There's no you know, mechanical parts to it. Uh, it's light. It's compact. So it works. Also in a tactical environment, if you don't have a portable suction or a mechanical suction device with you, just roll them on their side. Let it drain out. Scoop it out. Get rid of it. Uh, don't leave them lying on their back. So the big thing we always push in the classes that I teach with, uh, for my guys is recovery position. Put them in a recovery position. Let them puke it out. Let it, let it flow out. But then if you have to maintain and manage your airway, roll them back on their back. Get all that stuff out of there. Now bag them up. They start to puke again, roll them over. Just that gravity is going to work. So we're not going to get too crazy into um, uh, suctioning necessarily. Uh, there's also, uh, they call it a new technique for the ALS providers. It's a suction-assisted intubation. They think this is this crazy new technique that, oh, look at this. What they're doing is they're taking a, a suction catheter. You have your whistle tip or your soft suction and you have your rigid tip or your yang cow or your tonsil tip, however you want to describe it. Um, what they're all excited about now is taking the yang cow, the solid uh, rigid tip suction device, sticking it in the patient's face, turning the suction on while the ALS provider tries to intubate to keep secretions out of the way. We've been doing this for years. <laughs> I mean, get your bad, bad pulmonary edema patient in there. It's, it's almost like a faucet running when you're trying to intubate them. Their mouth just keeps filling up with fluid. We've done this for years. I hand somebody the suction. Here, take this, stick it in their mouth, and hold it there while I intubate them. All right, it's not a big deal. So when we talk about suction and airway management, you've got to keep the airway clear. Whether it's through a mechanical device, uh, just something as simple as a 60cc syringe and an NPA, um, rolling them on their side. You've got to keep that airway clear. That's all about maintaining a airway, a patent airway. It's got to be kept clear. So I don't care how you do it. Just keep it clear. So real quick, let's put these slide slides up. Here's a quick refresher. NPA, nasal pharyngeal airway. All right, easy. Uh, we've been using these for years. As far as I'm concerned, it's a highly underused device. I think they're great. Uh, you're... Post-seizure patients, perhaps. Your opioid overdoses, definitely. Uh, your altered mental status patients. Uh, these are fantastic. They're great because you can put them in somebody who has an intact gag reflex, or you can put them in somebody who doesn't have an intact gag reflex. They're light. They're compact. So in a tactical environment, that's really all you're going to see are NPAs. Uh, OPAs are a bit more rigid and a bit more difficult to, to compress and, and to carry around. But they're wonderful devices. They work very, very well. 
And here are the questions that I typically get is, well, how do you know if a patient really needs it or not? Okay, here's from me to you. If your patient is lying there and they appear to be unconscious, unresponsive, and you've tried to check them out and they're not waking up, you go to jam an NPA or an OPA in somebody's nose or mouth and they accept it, okay, they needed it. Good job. Strong work. If they fight you on it, well, then they don't need it, <laughs> okay? That's just a good way of thinking about it. If your patient is conscious and having, quote-unquote, trouble breathing, they just can't catch their breath, they're having trouble breathing, they do not need NPAs and OPAs. They may need some oxygen, or you may need to figure out why they're having trouble breathing and treat the cause. But beyond that, an NPA or an OPA is only designed to maintain patency, Keep the airway open. It does nothing for somebody who's having trouble breathing. All right? So just to make that clear. Um, so on another slide here, you'll see just a, a quick description of where the NPA would actually reside. goes in the nose, all right, nasal pharynx, uh, down to the posterior oropharynx, and it keeps the uh, airway open. I'm not going to get into a long discussion of how to measure them. Um, again, most of the people watching this have done this countless times. So I'm not going to bore you with that. Uh, next thing to look at is the OPA, of course. OPA is a great device. Works very well. For those of you who have bagged a patient who is unconscious, unresponsive without an NPA or OPA, and then with an NPA, OPA, you will see a night and day difference, quite frankly, of the compliance of the bag and how uh, the patient management rise and fall of the chest so really, something as simple as an NPA in a patient makes a world of difference. A properly sized and placed NPA makes a world of difference. So when we look at where the OPA actually resides and sits, you'll see from this picture here that a properly sized and placed OPA sits just under the tongue, goes into the posterior oropharynx, and the flange actually sits somewhat flush with the, uh, the gum line or the teeth. That's a properly placed OPA. All right, let me go ahead and pull this down. So as we transition from NPA, OPA, which is your basic of basic airways. Now, I guess more basic is head tilt, chin lift, modified jaw thrust, recovery position. Those are basic. If we're getting into putting in NPAs and OPAs, now your patient is definitely in the sick category. If they've accepted the NPA, OPA, and they've allowed you to start to bag for them, that's a sick patient. Something's going on. Um, if it's just an opioid overdose, that's not a sick patient. If they're an opioid overdose of their own doing, that's just a stupid patient. Uh, and we make careers on stupid people. That's what we do. So if we have an opioid overdose, easy. Their biggest problem is that they're not breathing well, not breathing fast enough, not breathing deep enough. Drop an NPA in that patient, Bag them up. You can sit there all day and wait for Narcan to show up. Or bag them up and take them to the hospital that way. The hospital will give them the Narcan. Easy stuff. So the next level, if you will, of airway adjuncts and management is your superglottic airways. Years ago, we had EOAs, EGTAs. Uh, then the combi tube came out. Uh, now we're more into the Kings and the eye gels. Uh, these are great devices. So again, from me to you, if you have somebody who's unconscious, unresponsive, and you give them an NPA and they take it, right, maybe the OPA will work. Drop the OPA in if you have it. If the OPA works, chances are they need a superglottic airway. Uh, and I'm just going to discuss iGel and King. Those are the more popular ones on the market right now. Uh, if they accept an iGel or a King as a BLS provider, well, now you're a rock star because you have secured that patient's airway. Have you necessarily protected it? Not 100%, no. There's only one device out there that secures and protects an airway, and that's an ET tube. And we'll talk about that here in just a little bit. So let me put this slide up. This is your eye gel. Uh, eye gel is a really nice device. Uh, came out a few years ago. No moving parts, no balloons, no nothing. Uh, you size it. You lubricate it, you stick it in their face, and it works. It really is a nice, nice device. Uh, so on this slide here, you'll actually see where it sits and how it sits. Um, 
This is reminiscent of a laryngeal mask airway or an LMA. Uh, the LMA had its time uh, in the EMS world and it just didn't, literally didn't sit well. It didn't sit well in the oropharynx that would come out. It wasn't a great pre-hospital device, but they use LMAs all the time inside the hospital. It's just pre-hospital versus in-hospital. In my opinion, the eye gel is like a pre-hospital LMA. That's just the way I think about it. Great device, uh, works very well. Compared to say the King Airway, King Airway is next generation combi tube. Combi tube had two big bulbs that you had to blow up. Uh, it worked, worked well, it was a nice device. Uh, but then the King came along and the King just simplified it. There's still two bulbs that blow up, but only one tube to blow them up with, which is nice. Again, they come in different sizes. I'm not going to sit here and go through the ins and outs of the, of the King. If you have the King in your organization, great. Uh, they work well. There's also the King LTSD that has a conduit for an NG tube or an OG tube or a gastric tube to be passed down through into the belly to decompress the belly, which is nice. Uh, because think about it, nine times out of ten before you get there, somebody has tried some very poor way of ventilating this patient with mouth to mouth. And by the time you get there, their belly is like a ripe melon. It's dunk, dunk, dunk. You can thump on this thing. It's full of air. Well, that air is coming out one way or the other. Uh, it's either coming out in vomit or it'll come out the other way. And trust me, I've had many a patient do that. And it's sad to say that even in a dead person that's farting, farts are funny and it makes you giggle. You just try not to do it in front of your patient's family. That is a, uh, <laughs> try to, you try to avoid that. So the King's, a, the King's a nice device. It works. It really does. So if we look here at this picture, this is just showing you a difference of how the King looks in place and how the eye gel looks in place. They basically reside in the same spot, but the mechanics or the design of them are just a little different in how they introduce the air. Both of them work well, as long as they're inserted properly. Uh, it's just a nice tool. For me on the ALS side, for any of my ALS providers, if your patient has a supraglottic airway in place, well, you know that they can take an ET tube. But the question you have to ask yourself in the clinical setting is should you pull it out? If it's working, and you're ventilating your patient and it's working well and your SATs are good and your end title is good, depending on your transport time to the ER, I'd say leave it alone. Worry about other things. If you got longer transport times, you're worried more about securing the airway, more protecting the airway. Yeah, you may think about extubation and reintubation with an ET tube, but that's your call. All right, let me go ahead and pull the slide down. So just to recap, We've gone through basic positioning, basic assessment, NPAs, OPAs, supraglottic airways. Um, one other thing to look at real quick are just BVMs. It's just a bag valve mask. It's such a basic, basic tool uh, taught at the EMR, EMT, all the way through paramedic level. But it's amazing how many people can't get this right. Uh, the EC hold, uh, the however, I don't care. Uh, everybody nowadays also wants to wear these big heavy beards, and that just makes life a lot more difficult for us, um, especially in the, uh, uh, in, not to say the tactical arena, that's not the right way to say it, anybody can have a beard, but you're finding more and more tactical operators uh, wearing these beards, uh, and it's just, it's very difficult to, to ventilate these people now because you can't get a good seal with that mask. So, things to think about. Let's go ahead and look at a picture of a BVM. This is any BVM USA. Uh, this is a one of who knows 30 different manufacturers. I have no idea of BVMs. I don't care which one you buy, uh, but there are certain components to it that always uh, come into play. The face mask, obviously, the expiratory valve, obviously. If you don't like your partner and your patient's full of all kinds of juicy deliciousness, uh, point that expiratory valve towards your patient and uh, you'll blow all kinds of nastiness on them. It's pretty disgusting. The PEEP valve. Uh, PEEP is positive end expiratory pressure. It's designed to keep your VLI popped open, and that's more of a, a different discussion altogether. There's CPAP, which we'll see here in a few minutes, and there's PEEP. They both provide the same physiological effect. They help keep an intrapulmonic pressure high, keeping your VLI open, keeping your patient ventilated. Matter of semantics between CPAP and PEEP, 
CPAP is done with an aviator's mask, and you'll see here in a few, a few minutes, and it's a pre-hospital technique, or it's an in-hospital technique in the ER. PEEP is more when you're on a ventilator, and it's a PEEP setting of uh, 7.5, 10 centimeters in water, and, uh, but that's more when you're intubated, you'll be put on PEEP. So I don't like the way they have it here as far as a PEEP valve. But anyway, there's also a pop-off valve. Uh, with a pop-off valve, that's usually what you'll find in your neonatal or your pediatric BVMs. Um, when we breathe normally, it takes about what's called five centimeters in water of pressure to keep our VLI open to have normal everyday uh, breathing. In cases of pulmonary edema, uh, we'll put somebody on CPAP and we may put them on 7.5 to 10 centimeters in water. It's just a different pressure to hold the VLI open. We'll talk about that, like I said, here in a little bit. But in your newborns, their VLI are collapsed. Remember what I talked about, the movie The Abyss, a bunch of horse shit. We do not breathe fluid for nine months. That is not how we roll. When we're born, and the doctor smacks us on the ass, and they really don't do that, and we take our first breath, <clears throat> we have to pop all of our VLI open. It actually does make that noise, by the way. All those VLI pop open, but that takes a significant amount of, uh, of pressure. I don't know the exact number, but from recollection, I want to say it can be, can be as high as 40 to 50 to 60 centimeters in water to get all those alveoli popped open. So if you have a newborn that pops out and um, they're not breathing, and you try to breathe for them with a pediatric bag, and that pop-off valve is not disabled, well, what the pop-off valve is designed to do is literally pop open to relieve pressure so you don't give somebody a pneumothorax. You don't pop their lung. So if you overpressurize the lung, you're going to pop it like a balloon. What a pop-off valve does is it prevents that from happening because as the pop-off valve starts to sense this interpulmonic pressure when you're trying to bag somebody, it pops and relieves the pressure and you're not able to ventilate the patient. So if you're going to, dis you have to disable that pop-off valve in newborns because you may need a higher, p uh, a higher pressure. And those pop-off valves may be set at 10, 15 uh, millimeters of mercury or centimeters in water. They may pop off at a very low setting where you need a higher setting of 40 to 50 to 60 to actually get the VLI open in a newborn. So what ends up being frustrating uh, for providers, especially pre-hospital care providers, is it's already a stressful scenario if we're delivering a baby. Now we have a baby who's not breathing. Well, that's really pucker factor time. Now you go to bag that patient and the pop-off valve keeps popping and you can't get rise and fall. You can't ventilate, you can't oxygenate this newborn and shit just starts to spiral out of control from there. You've got to know to, to disable that pop-off valve so that you can get that high pressure so you can bag that newborn and pop those VLI open. So a lot of people don't really know about those pop-off valves, but they are very important. Uh, the rest of the BVM, we all know, between the bag and the O2 reservoir and the reservoir bag itself, uh, pretty, pretty easy stuff. This would be the example of a BVM that is 50% more expensive than any other BVM because it's painted black and they label it as tactical. It's crap. It's all the same thing, right? It's a little less fancy, to say the least, but in the pre-hospital environment, in a tactical environment, this is somewhat compact, I guess as compact as you're going to find, um, but it, it doesn't have all the bells and whistles of the other BVM, but it works very well. But the fact that it is painted black and um, is labeled as tactical uh, makes it about 50% more expensive, which is ridiculous. Okay, let me stay on track here and make sure we're looking good. Let's look real quickly at um, a CPAP device. Uh, CPAP is continuous positive airway pressure, and there's a lot of misconceptions about this. Let me put this screen up. It looks like an aviator's mask. And if you look at it, it's designed for the patient who is having trouble breathing because of fluid in their lungs, uh, congestive heart failure, acute pulmonary edema, and some protocols they'll use these for the uh, asthmatic patients. And if you look at that device, you'll see on the nose of it, there's a little nebulizer that hooks up underneath so you can put albuterol or um, uh, atrovent in there. But look at the, the numbers, 5, 7.5, 10. That's the amount of centimeters in water you can set this device at. Now, again, this is one device out of 
20 different manufacturers, so I'm not endorsing any one type, but this is just one. It goes on the patient's face, and contrary to popular belief, this does not force air into your patient. That's not how it works. What this does is it provides a resistance on exhalation. So if you've ever walked around any shopping mall USA in Florida, and I'll pick on Florida a little bit because my parents live down there, you go to any shopping mall in Florida at 5 o'clock in the morning, and you're going to see the mall walkers. They're out there. They got their sneakers on, and they're getting it, man. They're walking around that shopping mall. The mall is closed. Or all the stores are closed. But they open the doors for these mall walkers because it's really the perfect environment for them. They're getting exercise. It's safe. Uh, there's no potholes. There's no cars. There's no dogs or alligators chasing them. Oh, and by the way, yeah, in one of those photos that was hanging behind me, a lot of people have asked me, yeah, that was an alligator I was holding up. I was scared to death. Uh, it was a dead alligator and part of our job at the fire department. We had to get rid of it. I don't know how we got sucked into that. But I'm holding that thing up and all I'm saying to my partner is, take the picture, take the picture, take it, take it, take it, take it. I couldn't wait to put that thing down. <laughs> anyway, those mall walkers are shooting around the mall, doing their thing, waiting for Starbucks to open. And they're getting their steps in. I give them credit. But if you watch some of them, they're pursed lip breathing. And let me go ahead and pull this slide down for a second. And we talk about pursed lip breathing. What you'll see is they're, they're mall walking, all right? They're getting it. Uh, and they'll... They're breathing against pursed lips, pursed lip breathing. What they're doing unconsciously is creating a positive end expiratory pressure or a type of peep. By blowing against pursed lips, they're increasing interthoracic pressure, correction, interpulmonic pressure, and they're keeping their VLI popped open, allowing them to breathe better. Uh, in your elderly population, cardiac disease, uh, CHF, that sort of thing. Some of them need that. In your infant population, uh, infants will, uh, if they're in, it's really an ominous sign, it's a bad sign, and we'll get into it more in pediatrics, but if you hear a patient who's grunting, an infant who's grunting, it almost sounds like they're trying to move their bowels. What they're doing is they're going, <coughs> and they're breathing against a closed glottis. Again, unconsciously, because they're trying to keep their VLI open. They're trying to keep their lungs expanded uh, to prevent atelectasis. Remember, we talked about that collapsing of the alveoli. This is them providing their own PEEP. Well, what we're doing with the CPAP mask is they're blowing against this pressure, 5, 7.5, 10 centimeters in water. That's what's creating that pressure. This CPAP device isn't forcing air into them. It's providing a resistance that they have to blow against. That's the difference. Works very, very well. Back in the day, we used to innovate CHFers all the time, uh, pulmonary edema patients all the time, and that was terrible because it's very difficult to get these patients off of a tube down the road. So it really doesn't no good. Um, CPAP prevents that. I shouldn't say prevents it. Really reduces the amount of times we have to innovate a pulmonary edema patient or a CHFer. Uh, years ago, we'd nasally intubate. It was just, it was barbaric. I hate nasal intubation. Ugh. Um, but CPAP is a fantastic device. So if I walk in a room and I can hear somebody with pulmonary edema on the other end of the house, and you can hear them, and they're, they're gurgling in their own fluids. It's really pretty disgusting. These are patients who need, this is the way I do it. You have to go through your steps and check your vital signs and sample and everything else. But they got a good, strong radial pulse and they have no allergies. I'm slapping about an inch of paste on them, nitro paste, putting them on CPAP and then doing everything else afterwards. Because that nitro is going to start opening them up, open up the container. And that CPAP is going to start to allow to push that fluid back into the container. And within a few minutes, they go from not being able to speak at all, maybe one word sentences, to being able to hold a conversation with me. And I don't have to innovate them. So it really is a nice device. So let's push on. Let's talk about ET tubes. Uh, there are some patients who desperately need to have their airway protected. In the traumatic, whether it be medical or trauma, there are some patients who have such significant facial trauma, let's say as an example, they need to be intubated to not only secure their airway, but protect it. My teeth! Oh! Oh, man, I'm real sorry about your mouth, Brian. 
Again, gotta, gotta love Brian from Family Guy. Um, so let's go ahead and throw this slide up here. Uh, this is just your basic ET tube. And I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on this because if I have advanced providers watching this, if you don't know these little things I'm about to tell you, you got bigger problems. These are basic, basic things. Uh, this is more just situational awareness for uh, our BLS folk. There's an ET tube. Uh, laryngoscope with a Mac blade. Uh, they have an OPA in there. I don't know why, but that's just a, an example of, a, of an ET tube. Um, when we look at the different laryngoscope blades, uh, we have Miller blades and we have Mac blades. I don't care which one you use. You should be comfortable with both, but naturally, ALS providers are going to migrate to one or the other. Me, personally, I like Mac. I know a lot of people who are Miller fans. Uh, well, <laughs> may have a drinking problem, but that's a whole other story. Uh, so it just depends. There's no right or wrong answer here. In the pediatric world, we tend to migrate more towards Miller blades because the epiglottis isn't quite as cartilaginous yet in the early stages of life. It's a bit more floppy and we have more control of it uh, with a Miller blade versus a Macintosh blade. So in this next picture here, this just shows where the ET tube resides. Here is the ET tube in the trachea, where it's supposed to be, protects the airway. So now if there's blood uh, in the airway, say Brian, uh, there's vomit coming up uh, from the esophagus, which happens all the time. This is going to protect the airway from aspiration. Simple enough. And what we look for, and we show you this slide here, we're looking at here the vocal cords, and this is just an example of a video laryngoscopy. We now have the tools and techniques to be able to use video guided devices to see the vocal cords very clearly through a little screen so that we can pass the ET tube through those pearly white vocal cords. That's our target. Pristine and perfect in that picture, but uh, we don't always see it that well. Uh, that's not the everyday occurrence. Sometimes you barely see any of it. And what we've started to adopt now over the years has been what's called the elastic gambuji. And let me show you a picture of that. Uh, the elastic gambuji, and you'll see uh, somebody here inserting it. It's just a, it happens to be blue, um, probe, if you will, with a little hook on the end of it or a little tip on the end of it that is slid into the vocal cords. And it, for us, is a guide wire of, of sorts to be able to pass that ET tube through. So if I have a difficult intubation, or more specifically, what this was designed for was the difficult intubation. Now, quite frankly, in standard of care, I use it for every intubation. I don't care if it's easy or hard. Uh, that tends to be the, the, the policy uh, now traditionally across the country. But I'll take that bougie for every patient. Find those cords snake into the trachea, and I'll know I'm in the trachea because I'll actually feel the tip of that bougie clicking along the cartilaginous rings of the trachea. I know I'm in the right spot. And I'll continue to push until I hit the carina, and then the bougie will actually stop. It won't go any further. So those are indicators for me I'm in the right spot. Then what I'll do is I'll take the ET tube, and I'll thread it literally over that bougie, and it can only then go into one place. It slides directly into the larynx, into the vocal cords, into the trachea. So it's a 100% success rate. It's perfect. Well, now, obviously, I hold on to the ET tube and I pull the bougie out. And now that tube resides in the proper spot. Um, in this next picture here, it talks about loading the bougie. Uh, this is from me to you. This is a personal preference. I don't care for this. If you like it, if you teach it, if that's how you roll, more power to you. Who the hell am I to tell you how to innovate your patient? But to me, it defeats the purpose of how the bougie was designed. The bougie was designed for me to feel in my fingertips as I pass that bougie into the trachea and feel those cartilaginous rings. If I load it into an ET tube as it is here in this picture, to me, it takes away that sensation. So what's the point? Why am I doing it? Uh, but that's just from me to you. If this is the way you do it, rock on. More power to you. As long as you get that tube in the right spot, I could care less where it is. Uh, so let's move on, and let me pull this slide down. And real quickly, let's talk about confirmation devices. For my BLS providers in the room, that tube is not in the right place until proven that it's in the right place. So end-tidal CO2, color metric devices, these are the only ways that we're going to be able to tell. 
So if your ALS provider looks at you and says, yeah, my tube's good. It's in the right spot. I've got good lung sounds and I got no belly sounds and I saw it go through the toilet. I got mist in the tube. It's not enough. You need to have full confirmation. So let me put this up. This is a color metric device. Basically, it's just a piece of litmus paper inside of uh, this little plastic container. Uh, after your patient is intubated, you slide this onto the top of the ET tube, and there's another area that you can't see that you bag into. So you bag into one end, and the other end is connected to the ET tube, and the patient's exhaled CO2 is going to change that litmus paper, hopefully, to the color yellow. Yellow meaning yes, yes, you're in the right spot. If it stays purple or gray, mm, you're probably not in the right spot. That patient needs to be extubated. Uh, because if that patient is being ventilated through that tube and into the belly, your patient's going to die because you're providing them no oxygen whatsoever. And a lot of people have, have succumbed to this over the years. Um, let me change the picture here. And now what we're looking at is an end tidal CO2 waveform. This is really uh, standard of care right now. If we're going to innovate somebody, you have to confirm that tube with end tidal CO2 detection. It's a protocol thing, but it really is standard of care nowadays. Under normal circumstances, uh, good circumstances, we should get a squared off waveform that looks a lot like this. Um, the upslope is that patient's exhalatory, expiratory CO2 plateau, and then they start to breathe in. That's not they breathe in, but we let off the bag. That's the downslope, and we go back to zero. 40. Anywhere between 35 and 45 is normal. So if it's at 40, well, life is good. So this is a perfect example of an end tidal CO2 waveform to show that you are in the right spot. This slide here is showing you all kinds of different ways that you can look at this to a tube becoming dislodged, to decreased CO2, to CPR. Uh, are we doing effective CPR? If we can't get our end tidal CO2 above 10 millimeters of mercury with good CPR and ventilation, that patient's good and dead, and there's a good chance you're going to leave them where they lie, depending on your protocol, of course. If you have a sudden increase in end tidal CO2 or ROSC, return of spontaneous circulation, that's what you might find, and that's an indicator to the ALS provider, hey, we might have a pulse back. There's the shark fin bronchospasm of asthma, hypo, hyperventilation, so... The end title can tell us a lot in the advanced field, but from BLS to ALS providers, if you're intubating your patient, if you're an ALS provider and you're intubating, you have to have end title CO2 to confirm. You have to. That's the standard of care. So what if you have your patient intubated and you're running into problems and you can't figure it out? Like they're not oxygenating well. They're deteriorating. Their color isn't getting any better. Something's wrong. We go with what's called a dope mnemonic. All right, so now all of a sudden you know that your tube is in the right spot. You're 100% certain of it, but nothing's making your patient better. Your mnemonic to troubleshoot this is called dope, dislodgement obstruction pneumothorax equipment. All right, so in your heart, you know the tube is good, but you're showing a zero on your end tidal CO2. That tube may have come out, may have dislodged. Uh, is it full up with lung butter? All right. Is there gunk in there and disgustingness? Is it obstructed? All right. You may have to clear your tube. Does the patient now have a tension pneumo? Did you pop a lung? All right. Check those lung sounds. And is it equipment failure? Uh, is the O2 not turned on? Is the cuff on the ET tube not blown up? Uh, or has it ruptured and it's not inflated at all? Uh, so is there a kink in the tube? Any number of different things. So this is a dope pneumonic to kind of get you through how to, how to troubleshoot your tube. So let me pull this down. So we've talked about assessing our patient all the way through to intubating and troubleshooting our intubated patient. So a lot of different things to think about and talk about. Tip of the iceberg. We went over it pretty quickly. Uh, we focused on some, uh, some uh, concepts and some tools and some toys. You're going to see new stuff come out nowadays uh, where... This is in theory, this isn't in practice yet, to where if you have somebody who's in cardiac arrest, they're saying take an NPA, NPA, OPA, non-rebreather mask, put it over their face, and just do good chest compressions. And passively, passive oxygenation, that patient is going to get air in, 
and keep sats in the low to mid 90s. So they're doing a lot of studies with this. This is not policy yet. Don't say, oh, well, Mike said, no, 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 no. But there's always new studies coming out. There's always new techniques coming out. So we'll just have to keep our eyes open for the latest and greatest. Um, I think that's about it. We're right on track. We're at 55 minutes, so we're looking good, almost an hour, so we'll stop here. Uh, I will endorse one product. Um, if you're looking for an advanced airway book or a difficult airway book, uh, hands down, the best one on the market is Ron Walls, Dr. Walls, W-A-L-L-S. He was out of Harvard. Um, I don't know what version they're up to now, third edition, fourth edition, I don't even know. I think it's third edition. Uh, the Ron Walls, a book on advanced airway, uh, difficult airway management. Fantastic book. It's probably one of the only endorsements you're ever going to hear me give on this on these videos. But if you're looking for a book to look at and study at the advanced level, even the basic level, uh, that's, that's the book. That's a good one. All right. That's it, gang. Uh, another video down. I hope everybody, again, is well and stays well and continues to, uh, to watch the videos. Again, I'm having a great time doing it. I'll try to keep everybody posted on the sale of my house and how everything is going. Um, the code word for our FBI folk is golf ball. Golf ball. Could be two words, I guess, depending on how you look at it. Now, let's see how you're going to put that one into a sentence. That'll be a good one. All right, everybody. It's always my pleasure. Uh, having a good time. Be safe. Be well. And we'll see you on the next video. Take care. Thank you.